Hi, welcome to Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at this HB 83475B, which is a light wave communication analyzer. Now, this looks like a pretty old unit, and that's because these guys evolved to eventually become the DCA and the DCA axis. Now, if you're not in the optical communication industry, you may have never seen one of these because this guy actually has an optical input directly on the oscilloscope itself, and this is the reason why I thought it's worthwhile taking a look at for repairing because of the optical input. Now, now the DCA and the DCA axis are all modular, so you can remove and put different modules in. And I've actually done a teardown of some of the DCA modules in one of my previous videos. Now, this particular one has a demodulation output directly connected to channel two because it also has two uh, electrical channels. And this is how they do the optical to electrical conversion. It's done internally, and then they take the electrical signal out and they pass it back to channel two. And you may ask why they do that. That's because you can also retrofit this unit with different kinds of filter. Like I have a filter here. This is an OC3 filter designed for 155.52 megabit per second. And this will shape the channel for you as you would traditionally see from, let's say, the optical experiments you're doing for this particular communication standard. So this is why this is done this way. And it's, this guy actually has quite a lot of bandwidth. It's 500 megahertz of bandwidth, but this is a subsampling oscilloscope. It's not a real-time oscilloscope. And I'll tell you what that means and why uh, it is designed the way it is and what the consequences of that are on the measurement. But nonetheless, this is still a pretty powerful unit, even though it's pretty, pretty old. And I'm eager to, turn to take it apart and see what's going on with it and why it doesn't work. It actually is supposed to be working Working, but this, they said that the screen just all of a sudden became very, very dark and, and they can no longer read what's going on. And they tried turning this and it doesn't work. Actually, it's pretty stiff now. But anyway, we'll take a look and see this is the brightness uh, knob there. So we can go and turn it on and take it apart and see what's going on and if we, can, if we can fix it. And then if we can fix it, we can do some optical experiments with it, which is pr probably something that you may not have come across unless you're in the industry. So it should be quite fun to do. Let's get started. And as always, of course, Pooch is supervising, making sure that everything is being done correctly. Aren't you, Pooch? Who is a good Pooch? Yes. So one thing I actually forgot to mention is that this unit does come with the GPAB converter. So there's a big connector here at the back which interfaces with this connector over here, which then turns into GPIB. And this is pretty handy because this has a whole bunch of masks and so on that you can read through the GPIB for automated testing. So anyway, we're going to take a look at this later. All right, let's do a power on test. I have it hooked up to my Sencor isolation transformer. Here we go. Let's see what happens. I hear the fan. And it's doing something. I see nothing still. No, I think what they were saying about the screen is definitely true. I don't see anything. Oh, no, wait a second. I see a line. But it's really, really dim. Let me see. That's very stiff. Oh, oops. OK, well, that's not what I wanted to do. So, oh, well. Well, that, that probably explains why it wasn't working. I wonder. Yeah, OK, that has to be opened. Never mind. So anyway, it's supposed to be working otherwise. So let's see, open it up and take a look inside. Also, we can explore how it's built, because it should be pretty interesting because of the optical input. Oh, and by the way, if you look here, you can see it's consuming 65 watts from 116 volts there from the isolation transformer. So it's not that low power when you think about it. But again, it has the, it's pretty old, and it also has a CRT. So I'm curious to see what it looks like inside. All right, let's go and see if we can take the back of here. I've taken the screws off, and it oh, seems like it's stuck on it. There we go. I managed to get it off. Oh, very nice. Look at that. It's, uh, it's a lot more empty than I thought it would be, but the design is really uh, clear, very straightforward. Let me zoom in a little bit here so we can talk about different pieces here. So obviously, the CRT is clearly over here, and it's a Toshiba branded, so made by not made by HP, obviously. And you can see the back board, the separate board for the back of the tube. This is very classic. Almost every design for CRTs that I've seen is done this way. You can see the vertical and horizontal coils there. Uh, here's the uh, high voltage flyback converter there, which connects obviously the high voltage electron tube that you can see there. And this board over here is the entire board responsible for driving and controlling the CRT. Interestingly enough, this board is completely independent. So the only way this connects to the rest of the instrument is with this ribbon cable. I don't see any other, no, there is no other connection, not even a power supply connection. So everything is really coming through here. Makes it quite serviceable. Single-sided board, uh, it's labeled, but I can't tell 
who is made, and maybe it's also made by Toshiba as well, but it is definitely made in Japan. Uh, that's a pretty nice design. And on this side, we can see the power supply, very classic HP power supply. This is not, again, something they've made themselves. They uh, buy this from somewhere else. I'm not sure which company. I guess they switch it around. Uh, once we take it apart further, we might be able to find out. Uh, nice capacitors, uh, Japanese. Uh, Comic cons, yeah, these are pretty good capacitors everywhere, 85 degrees Celsius, though. Uh, pretty straightforward, nothing too fancy there. And you can see again one cable coming out, all the power supply is going to be coming out of here. Very serviceable because it's in different sections, very modular. And if you can see from that angle, all the rotary switches from the front panel are over here. So that's pretty nice as well. But it looks like the acquisition board and everything else is on the other side. So let me get this out of the way. We can rotate this and see what's going on on the other side. And there it is. Look at that. That's pretty nice. Let me zoom out a little bit more here. Yeah, you can see a very clean design there. So there's this connector going across, connects to another board on this side. I'll show you that in a second. Here's the front, uh, analog front end there. And well, if you take a look at it, what is it that you don't see right away? What is missing? Well, if you haven't guessed, we don't see any high-speed ADCs. It's because this doesn't have high-speed ADCs. It's a subsampling oscilloscope. In fact, we have to look for some axis of symmetry, and I think I see it. Let me see if I can maybe just take this connector off for the purposes of being able to see what's going on. There we go. So you can see that there is some symmetry here. So there's a replica components here, replica components here, and here. And these are obviously from the two channels. Now, by the look of this, this is the Motorola part. Uh, I have to, I have never seen this part number before, but I have. And looking at the way this looks, I would say these must be the ADCs. This thing has tons and tons of HP branded parts. It's crazy. There's here, here. This is HP branded. Everything that has a label on it is either a firmware HP or HP branded part. It's pretty impressive how much uh, custom design is on here. A lot of Motorola parts all over the place. So we have to look and see if these are the ADCs indeed. But this would be very low speed, you know, maybe in the 10 or 20 megahertz range, 20 mega samples per second, even though this has a 500 megahertz band. But like I said, this is a subsampling oscilloscope, not a real time oscilloscope. So everything else looks pretty straightforward. Uh, there is our battery backup RAM, which will have all the calibration coefficients in there. And there is some um, firmware. Uh, let me see, you can read anything there. Revision A 1.32, some firmware in there. This is a UV erasable part, which is also quite common for that era. Other than that, I don't see anything uh, unusual there. This is, I believe, the trigger or the reference. I can't remember. I have to look at the back of the unit. Let me see, what does it say? That is the, oh, that's the DC calibration output. Never mind. Uh, this is for calibrating the front end. So I wonder if that's working. Then we can try out and figure out if it's still functional. Some relay here, uh, some connectors there, perhaps for some options that this doesn't have, or some testing during manufacturing and so on. Ah, I just realized something. I just found the problem. There we go. There's our problem. It's this thing. This is the, uh, the brightness control knob. It has come out of its uh, location where it's supposed to go, like that, I believe. There we go. Now it turns, so I wonder if that fixes the problem. Like I said, it's not really much of a repair, but I think that's, that's what was causing the issue. Uh, that's what came loose. So we're going to find out if that still works. Uh, other than that, nothing uh, unusual there. Let me plug this back so we can rotate this a little bit again. And, ah, this is pretty interesting. Check this out. This is our optical portion. So, sorry, let me rotate this to see where is this fiber up coming from. Ah, there it is. So, okay, okay that makes sense now. So right over here, where you cannot see where the, the tip of this is, is the optical input. And that fiber goes over here. And this is that orange fiber over here. And it looks like it goes into a collimator and then into a photo detector right there. So this card actually is something that can be plugged out and plugged back in uh, for modifying perhaps the wavelength sensitivity or calibrating these ahead of time. But it's an interesting design that the fiber comes in and then just directly onto this detector there. And you can see the analog signal coming back there and going into the front end, which makes sense since, I guess, uh, in some way going through the same filtering uh, or something, or to bring it to the front. Ah, never mind. No, I take that back. This goes in there in order to come out of the front. If you remember, there is a uh, optical to electrical conversion, and the electrical signal comes out of the front. So this is how they capture. But they, they must be doing something to it, amplifying it or something else before they pass it to the front. There's also another one over here also going 
to the front end. So there's a couple of other things happening before this comes out. It's not directly coming out. It has to go through some TIA anyway, which I wonder if that this part is could be a transient impedance amplifier right over here, and some filtering and some biasing afterwards. So pretty straightforward from that perspective, a whole bunch of analog circuitry up here, uh, supporting circuitry for this. Some connectors here. By the way, this thing has tons and tons of potentiometers on it. Everywhere I look, I see a few. There's two over here. There's a bunch scattered around here. There's some over there. And then I saw a whole bunch of them on the CRT board. There's just like, you know, here, 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 here. <laughs> they're all locked down. They're all painted over so you know where the default position is. And here's a, a focus knob. Uh, so you can actually adjust the focus directly on there. So it is nice that it's so modular. That will allow us to uh, experiment with it because of that. But other than that, I, I don't see anything immediately wrong. Uh, but we'll have to turn it back on and see if it, the, the picture is clear. But I'd be very curious on doing some optical tests on it to see if it still works. And I also want to show you what the, some of the consequences of this subsampling architecture actually is on looking at the signal. And here's that part I was talking about, that it is indeed an A to D converter, the MC10319 Motorola part. This is a high-speed 8-bit analog to digital converter, but this is not nearly as high-speed as you think. This only has a 25 megahertz maximum sample rate, so it has a 12.5 megahertz NICOS input bandwidth. But this scope has 500 megahertz of bandwidth, as I was saying, because it's using subsampling architecture, so you can only look at periodic signals, and the DSP will then reconstruct the waveform and give you the periodic representation of the waveform on the screen. If you give it a non-periodic signal, it wouldn't be able to give you anything. And this is why you, you can use this to create an eye diagram, because in an eye diagram, your signal has very predictable edges, so you can trigger on the predictable edges and reconstruct your eye without having to see each individual bit. So you wouldn't be able to see each individual bit, and we will talk about this and see it when we're testing it, hopefully if it works. Now, what, another thing that's interesting about this is that because it has 256 parallel comparators, it's a flash architecture. And at the time, flash architectures were the, the way to build high-speed ADCs. It's no longer the case, but it's pretty interesting to see that you know this is a high-speed A to D converter at 25 mega samples per second. Another cool thing about this architecture is that because the resistive divider in the comparator bank is actually coming outside of the chip, you are able to cascade two of these and be able to get 9 bits. So you could use two of these together to get a 9 bit resolution A to D converter. The disadvantage is that because each of these are putting out 8 bit parallel data, you'd have to reprocess those data in some way to get your complete 9 bit signal. So I think there's a block diagram actually of that somewhere all the way down here, I think it's figure 27. I was looking at it a little bit before. Here we go. So this is figure 27. This is how you can make a 9-bit A to D converter. You use two of these in a row, and you can see that the resistive divider coming out, and you got some uh, resistor in the middle, which you can adjust and you know calibrate out and so on. And it's not so easy. You can't just connect them and expect it to work. You'd have to do some playing around with the, getting the levels correctly. But Pretty cool, and you see there are some optional latches at the output here once you collect the digital data from all the, all of this, and these latches will synchronize the data coming out if there is some delays between them and the traces are not the same length. There's a slower, one of the chips is a bit slower than the other one, but you can see that you would feed them with the same 25 megahertz clock. So you know, the only difference being that uh, this is now applied in phase in both of them, so the data is being processed at the same time because this is not time interleaving, that's a very different phenomenon. This is literally doubling your hardware uh, and, and simultaneously looking at this because the dynamic range, the full scale input to the A to D converters are actually extended because of the fact that you can take the resistor uh, dividers out of the chip and connect them together. So your entire resistive ladder now is, is extended between two ICs. It's like literally like putting them together as if they were in the same die. So really, anyway, pretty cool. I just wanted to show you, give you a bit of an idea, just some driving circuitry uh, for doing some digitizing of video. So it's really cool. Just looking at the data sheet, you can learn so much about these components if you've never worked with them. So I highly recommend it, and I always try to show you a data sheet of at least one new part uh, when I do a repair of some kind. So I hope that you like this one. Let's get back to the unit. All right, let's power it on while it's still open and see what happens. There we go. Well, it's booting up again. It's making the same noises. I, it took a while before anything showed up on the screen last time. Or did I break it now even further? What's going on with this? Oh, there we go. There's the line. Now let me see uh, here. It's, ah, there we go. There, check it out. Nice and bright. I fixed it. I'm a genius. So now the question is, um, is this in the middle of the screen? Yeah, or uh, maybe not. It looks like it's a bit 
rotate it anyway but uh, that might be adjustable from the uh, CRT unit itself but yeah the button seems to work and uh, let me see if it has a default setup yeah default setup there we go yeah, it looks looks fine and the screen is not perfectly centered like as I was saying but it's definitely completely usable I and mean, you can see it's nice and crisp it's readable so the question is now can it be uh, does it display any signal there's only one way to find out you're gonna hook it up to some synthesizer all right, now I'm generating a 50 megahertz tone using the arbitrary waveform generator, and I want to look at it on the scope. So here's channel one. Let's hook up channel one to channel one here. Oh, look at that. That's quite a mess. And look at channel two on channel two. So there we go. So obviously right now we're seeing gibberish, and this is one of the reasons is because this scope cannot do anti-aliasing. So as you can clearly see, this is an aliasing uh, phenomenon. If I keep uh, reducing the time step, you can see eventually the waveform will look like this and then the sinusoid would emerge from it. Now this should be 50 ohm terminator so let me turn the 50 ohm termination on and there is a nice sinusoid waveform. Now if I enable channel 2 and enable that to be 50 ohm, right now channel 2 is set to electrical. You can see that you can go electrical or optical or off so right now we are on electricals so therefore the units are in millivolts as opposed to microwatts. Uh, so yeah it looks nice you can see the two tones are 90 degrees apart as they should be because this particular orb right now is generating them in quadrature so it looks very good and I can increase the frequency let's say from 50 megahertz to 100 megahertz that should be pretty easy and it's gonna dis dis disappear for a second and it's gonna come back and there it is 100 megahertz tones now this is like I said a subsampling scope so it's reconstructing the signal counting on the fact that it's periodic so it's capturing very very far step uh, points and then going back and capturing again, going back and capturing again, and slowly building this waveform, relying on very precise timing each time. So that's why when uh, when I press stop, I cannot. As soon as I touch this, the waveform's gone uh, because it doesn't have it in memory in a traditional sense that you would see from a full real-time scope. So it looks pretty good. I no complaint there. But normally you don't look at this sinusoid signals on, on something like this. You're interested in looking at eye diagrams. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an eye diagram using the ARP. Now it's going to be a little bit tricky here. So what I'm going to do is create a QPSK at 50 megabit per second. Now but QPSK is a complex modulation and it's going to come out as two orthogonal signals I and Q. So channel one is going to be I, channel two is going to be Q. And we can look at them simultaneously and they're going to be independent bit streams. Now this ARB is so good that I can use one channel as a trigger of the other channel. Traditionally, you normally don't do that. You have to use either an external trigger, you use another signal. But for our purposes, it should be okay. So I'm going to go ahead and download that. Now when I download this, you're going to be able to see the eye diagram. Now, for the pulse shaping, I'm using a raised cosine, but I'm, I have a coefficient of 1. So basically, it has almost no filtering, so just a perfect, it's a complete uh, twice Nyquist bandwidth, so it has no filter bandwidth re reduction at all, and we will see the effect of that, and it will be interesting to see on the eye diagram. So let me turn off channel 2, and look at only channel 1, and because we are triggering on the rising edge there, you can see that we're missing the, the falling edge traces over there. Now, I'm going to turn on channel 2, and make sure it's electrical, and let me bring the amplitude back. I'm going to turn the channel 1 off. So channel 1 is now turned off. And there is our eye diagram. Look at it. It looks really nice. It's very clean. It's extremely low jitter. Uh, like I said, it's the, the raised cosine coefficient is 1. So I can go and do some measurement on this. And this is where this thing basically is intended to be used. So let's go and do some, some time measurements on it. And I'm going to turn this into an NRZ mode. So now I can make some NRZ measurements. For example, let's say I want to see the bitrate. I'm going to turn the bitrate on. And it's going to, oh, that's the wrong channel. That's not what I wanted to do. Where is my source? Channel 2. And, and bitrate on channel 2. I imagine only available on the channel, one channel at a time. Ah, oh, this thing is, okay, fine. You go away. Now, this is not a friendly bitrate. There we go. Jesus. Okay, now we gotta wait a moment until it collects the data. It's not as, as quick as you'd want it to be. It's, it's funny how when it's collecting data, it says cltg.data, 
which I guess means collecting data. It's pretty funny. Anyway, so there it is. You can see it's showing 49.81 megabits per second. There it is, 50 megabits per second. Remember, it has to collect a lot of data, process it in order to be able to find out the exact timing. It has to cap calculate the edges, do a correlation. It does a lot of stuff in the background. And there it is, 50 megabit per second. So it is indeed doing this correctly. It's, it can capture uh, the, the correct data rate. And let's, what about um, a total RMS jitter? Now, total RMS jitter for this should be very good. So I'm going to turn that on. I'm also going to turn on the duty cycle distortion. So it's going to collect some data. Let's wait for it for a bit uh, until it settles down. There you go. So now if you look at this, although these measurements don't quite settled up yet. Let's just wait. OK, it's good enough for our purposes. So the RMS jitter is 150 picosecond. And the duty cycle distortion is 500 picoseconds. So this you can see, that's pretty good for, you know, it's only 50 megabits per second, but it's pretty good. So now I'm going to increase the root raise cosine coefficient. Now this is going to reduce the overall system bandwidth, but it's going to add ISI on purpose. This is done all the time in wireless systems because you don't want to trans, you don't want to occupy a lot of bandwidth. It has to do with how much bandwidth you want to occupy versus how much sensitivity you have. So let's go ahead and change that from 1 to 0 0.5. I'm going to download that. So now we have a raised cosine with the coefficient of 0.5. I'm going to wait for it to come back. And there it is. So now it's the same same bit rate. Everything is exactly the same, except I have purposely added ISI to it to reduce the overall bandwidth of the system. You can see the eye diagram clearly influenced. You can clearly see the jitter. The data rate hasn't changed. Now it's going to come back any moment once it figures it out. There you go. But look at that. The jitter RMS has significantly gone up, but the duty cycle distortion is huge. And this is obviously because of the fact that I've added so much jitter uh, in order to reduce the bandwidth. So these are common techniques in data communication. And this is the purpose of this instrument, is to give you these type of measurements, you know, rise time, fall time, quality of the eye diagram, and so on. Now if I go back to my original I diagram again where the signals was very clear we can see that you know, we're back to normal and then once you wait a little bit these data will be updated with the new values and it will be nice and clean again so pretty happy about that now one thing we haven't tested is we haven't actually tested to see if the optical input is still working or not so that's one of the things that we need to uh, to figure out now let me see why is this not giving me data again I'd imagine that this thing would have been pretty frustrating to use in the lab in the old days when people were actually trying to get measurements out of this because it takes so long for it to to give you any data there you go yeah it does take so you got to be careful with this you know you cannot just read the first number you see but yeah it, it clearly works so it has to do a lot of crunking in the background let me see what else can we measure with this that might be interesting uh rice time can we give me rice time where is it there you go rice time 15 uh, uh i got 12 nanosecond is it settled down now yeah 12 nanosecond yeah sounds about right so yeah, it looks good. I don't see anything wrong with it. Obviously, the front end works. They, the, all the knobs seem to work. Uh, the triggering seems to work fine. And I can, you can see that I can change the source of the trigger. Right now, I'm triggering in channel 1, looking at channel 2. And if I do that, you can see that we will lose that edge. So, wow, that's a big clunk in there. Uh, yeah, it looks good. So, let's try and see if we can feed it some optical data. Now, that's going to be a little bit more difficult because I need to invoke a few instruments to do that. But I think we might be able to get something going. Now there was one other little thing I wanted to show you before I move on actually, and that is a multi-level signal and the importance of having a proper trigger. So I'm going to change that from QPSK to 16 QAM. Now as soon as I change it to 16 QAM, this is going to change from NRZ to PAM4, because that's how you can create a 16 QAM signal, is with two PAM4 signals in quadrature. So let's go and turn channel 1 on again, and let's turn channel 2 off for a moment so we can see it triggering on here. Now, as soon as I download the 16 QAM signal, you will see multi-level, and you'll see that the trigger point is going to become pretty important. So I'm going to move the trigger point. Now, you can see if I put the trigger point in the right place, we will be able to trigger it such that we have a reasonably good four-level signal being displayed here. Now, this is not really a good way to do this, because no matter what, we are always at this edge that's moving back and forth. So you don't want to be at that point. You want to have a nice sinusoid for triggering. But I don't have that available, so I have no choice but to do this. Now, if I turn on channel 2 back on and put it onto electrical and adjust the amplitude, 
and turn channel 1 off again, you can clearly see a multi-level signal. Here's our PAM4, you can see 1, 2, 3, 4 levels, and you can see the open eyes in the middle of each one. It's gonna look, it doesn't look very good because of the fact that I have poor trigger. If I had a good trigger, this would look much, much nicer. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to be able to I, provide the correct signal to the test instrument, otherwise you get bad result like this, thinking that it's because of your device, but it's reality just because this is poorly set up. But anyway, let's go back and see if we can get the optical setup up and running. All right, and here is our optical setup. This end of the lab is actually where I kept all the optical equipment. And uh, so here is the same electrical signal I was looking at before. This coming from through this SMA cable. It goes into a power splitter. And the op one of the operators of the power splitter is going through this HP 83430A. And this is a light wave transmitter allowing me to do electro-optic modulation. So here electrical signal goes in there and optical modulator signal comes out. And right now I'm connected to the AC coupled input and so on. The details are not that important. And the optical signal coming out is a bit too strong, so I'm putting it through this Anritsu MN9610B, which is an optical attenuator, all the way at the top right here. And the attenuator output then comes out and then goes into our HP unit. Now the DAC signal is coming all the way from the other side of the lab, that's where we were just a moment ago, but now I'm taking that signal and passing it through the light wave modulator, and here it is. Let's take a look and see if we see something recognizable there. So this is the same electrical signal, so you can see it's also present here. Now I'm going to turn on the optical signal, and remember I'm triggering on the electrical signal, that's why you see the rising edge there, and I'm turning the optical signal on. Let me turn the electrical signal off. And there it is, check it out. You can see clearly our optical signal, that's optical modulation is quite, goes through a quite non-linear modulator. That's why the nice sinusoidal transitions of the electrical signal has turned into these very sharp edges. And this is normal and you can see the, the transition has some uh, zero crossing uh, problems there that I might be able to adjust by playing with the uh, biasing of the modulator. There you go, you see I can fix it. I can create uh, zero crossing at the very bottom, which is quite poor and up there which is quite poor so you don't want a duty cycle distortion there right there in the middle is where they got a nice 50 percent there so that's quite nice there and you can clearly see now i'm going to leave this as a trick question to you why do i see again nothing there and nothing there i'm going to leave that to you to figure out uh, whereas before we were seeing a nice full eye diagram now we're having this missing section is again it's pretty straightforward i'm sure you can figure it out and uh, yeah so it looks it uh, looks like it's a fully functional unit, so I'm really happy with it. It's going to be helpful for diagnosing optical stuff. Like I said, this portion of the lab here is where I kept all my optical stuff. I've done a lot of optical experiments over the years for you guys, and uh, that unit at the far back is the one that I repaired recently where the power supply was bad. There's a, quite a bit of interesting things we can do to this optical stuff here in the lab. But anyway, let me know what you think about this video. This was something I quickly decided to do. And let me know if you like this type of things, and I will do more of them. If not, we'll just stick back to the regular format. So next video will most likely be another repair or a review that I've been preparing. So I hope you enjoy this. See you soon.